eating is a break in life. We are meant to be sitting down, we are meant to be stopping whatever else we're doing and sit and eat, right? If we look at, you know, in France, they do a really good job of this. Guess what? In France, most people are slim, right? It's not because they're not eating, you know, croissants and butter, because they are, but they're stopping to eat. They're, um, they're really separating. Again, it's there's movement of life and then there's a break in life for food. Hello and welcome to Sugar Free TV. We are so excited for today's episode. And we are joined by Kiki Athanas, who is an intuitive eating coach and I am so sure we're going to have so much to talk about today. We are so excited to have you here, Kiki. How are you doing? I'm doing awesome. I'm so excited to be on your show. I think it's uh, such a great idea and platform and um, yeah, honored to to be here and, and share what I'm about to. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Yeah, I mean, we really can't wait to, um, I am so intrigued about the work that you do. Um, and yeah, yeah both, of, both of us. Mm -hmm. So Kiki, so tell us basically your 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 story, intuitive eating coach. I'm so intrigued by that title. Mm -hmm. Tell us what you do and how you you found this talent that you have. Well, thank you for asking. Well, um, it didn't start this way. I actually started with um, what I would call an obsession with wellness, and it came from a healthy place to start, but um, uh, leaving home and going to university and um, kind of being able to cook meals for myself and work out and all these things, um, I realized how much I love health, wellness, nutrition, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it served me really well for the first few years. And then I took a turn. I sort of took this path to obsessing about it a lot more than I wanted to. And um, the food restrictions became exhausting and the exercising became over exercising and the fast, you know, the intermittent fasting became always fasting. And um, I eventually uh, came to this place where now there's a term for it and it's orthorexia. It's this obsession with healthy eating that becomes unhealthy. And um, and the consequences of that was actually I ended up gaining weight because because I was restricting all of the time, I would end up binging um, and then the cycle would continue. Um, so I found intuitive eating, mindful eating as a way to really um, reconnect with the reason that I got into health in the first place, which is making connected, healthy choices that make me feel good, but not being dogmatic about it, not being so black or white, but really um, coming from a ceiling place and reconnecting with my gut versus trying to do everything in my head. And um, it, I really was able to reconnect with those visceral sensations in my stomach. Um, and that's now what I help other women do who feel like, you know, they're addicted to sugar or they're binging on the, you know, the different foods. And it's like, you don't have to create more rules in your head. You actually just have to tap into your body because, you know, our bodies don't want a gazillion pieces of chocolate cake. Like your gut isn't calling for that. It doesn't. And your gut is not addicted to sugar. Um, it's that, you know, you've created these habits because you were so focused on being in your head with it that once you really surrender to the body, the healthy choices that you want to make from your head actually come naturally from your body. And it sounds a little woo-woo, but there is quite a structure and a framework to it. And it was really powerful for me. And it's really powerful for people that resonate with kind of being addicted to food. I mean, immediately just blown my mind. I've got so many. We, we, we could talk all day and all night, seriously. So amazing, isn't it? Fantastic. And I can see from your name that you are Greek. Are you Greek? Half Greek? I am. I'm half Greek and I'm half British. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, well, the, the Greek side surely must be a lot about food as well. But I'm half, well, I'm 100% Latin American, but I'm <laughs> but 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 whatever. Um, but but we're all about the food. And when I get together with my Greek friends, I mean, you know, yeah, it's about the food for sure. Um, and you know, there's there's pros and cons. I think that um, you know, of course, looking at the Mediterranean diet, it's very balanced. Of course, what we what most people would consider very healthy. And I think the healthiest part of it is really that they connect with their food, especially. You know, it's like 
it's uh, it's an experience eating, right? You're sitting down, you're telling the body that it's calm, that you can get into rest and digest. There's no rush to eat everything. There, we're talking about the food, right? I think in North America, um, uh, where I'm from, uh, it's it, well, like born anyways, the passport wise, um, you know, it's almost like you'll go out for dinner with a friend and God forbid you actually address that you're fueling the physical body. Like this is an intimate ritual that you're having with yourself. And that's what I do love about going back to Greece. It's like you really do connect with the food. Um, with that said, I've also picked up um, certain kind of what I call in my work non-value-based beliefs around my eating patterns that I think are kind of influenced by, for instance, my dad would like rush his eating, right? He would like eat super, super fast. And um, so I kind of had to retrain myself to be like, what's the rush? I don't have to, you know, eat all of this as quick as possible and, um, you know, really slow down and get more into that, the Mediterranean, you know, lifestyle, which is slow. Uh, <laughs> oh my goodness. I mean, my mom would love you. <laughs> Just because I'm the fast eater, she's like, what? And she likes to do this thing called sobre mesa in, in Spanish, which is like at the table. And you just like, I mean, we like, we don't have all day, but the table has all day. And you sit at the table after a meal and you just talk and talk and chat and that's digestion time. And I'm, I'm always in a rush because I look so much to do. So I, I totally get the um, understand that actually the importance, it's so nice to connect with people from cultures where the food is. It's part of that ritual of togetherness, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And and it goes to show that like when you're when you're cooking for yourself and your family and you're having this experience and, and really tapping in, you don't have to strategize like, oh, let's like make it healthy. You naturally want to cook foods that are gonna feel good for you, are going to nourish you from the inside out. And we again just kind of organically choose healthier foods. Um, and so it's another example of the fact that we don't need to be so head driven about everything and can really reconnect with that feeling side of us. And funnily enough, actually, when I've been in Greece, you've almost got to do a, 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 a this thing where you've got to readjust your own expectations if you go to a restaurant in terms of how long you're going to be there. Because in the UK, it's a well, I mean, you know, you're looking at your watch, sort of, well, this is taking a long time. And of course, there's no rush. And, but of course, that's because, uh, you know, if you were to go to a, have a table at nine o'clock, yeah, you, you could be there till 11 at night. Where, you don't know uh, in America to half past 11 at night. But it's like, still at home at eight o'clock, getting, waking up from yesterday or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. You know, that midnight half dinner. <laughs> It's all about food. That's fascinating. Oh, I mean, oh, gosh. So talk to us about, in terms of, um, this sounds to me like a very female-centric experience that you you just tapped into all types of my bit of intuition coming through here. And it's they're all like, do firing up. So this, this is, I have talked to Luke about relationship with food. And um, one of the things that we want to strive in our uh, brand commitment is to remove the guilt from eating because like it's just such a toxic cycle of I'm feeling bad that this bad food exists is there. and it's just that whole kind of um diet toxic culture a very um very kind of uh, psychologically and emotionally toxic behavior around food so we kind of want to remove that and I kept saying to him well guilt free such and such guilt and he's like what are you talking about guilt he didn't feel any guilt didn't whatsoever know, yeah, I, didn't I, know. I started talking more and it seems to be such a female emotion around food. So tell us a bit about about that because you're nodding. <laughs> yes, um, that's so funny that you mentioned that because oftentimes, so I work um, exclusively with women and um, oftentimes they'll, they'll have a partner where they'll um, recognize that it's like, uh, you know, my husband just kind of eats what he wants. Sometimes he's hungry. Sometimes he's not and he can refuse food. And it's like, he's slender, he's healthy, he doesn't even try, right? And it's like, they're, they're so irritated that it's just like, oh, he just kind of does what he wants um, and everything kind of works out. And it goes to show that it's um, 
we create interference from actually connecting with our hunger and our satiety by feeling like we have to strategize everything in our head, right? So um, if we look at the example of, and of course, some men struggle with food too, but oftentimes they're more naturally intuitive eaters. What does this mean? It means that they're connected to the feeling inside of their gut so that when they're hungry, there's no judgment of, oh, but it's too early in the morning or, oh, it's too late at night. Like they're just like, oh, I'm hungry. I'm going to eat, right? Because they're always looking to maximize the abundance of pleasure in their body, right? Whereas women were like, oh, you, I'm hungry, but oh, no, no, no. Like I'm intermittent fasting. I can't be hungry right now. I need to wait for, you know, it's too early in the morning or it's I can't eat before bed. That's bad. And, and we're putting ourselves in this state of deprivation where we're putting, you know, certain things are off limits, whether it be the food or the timing. And then what happens? We naturally want it. We're programming ourselves to want it, even if we don't actually want it because we're making it off limits. Whereas with men, oftentimes they don't put things off limits. So they only want them in moderation, right? They're not saying, oh my God, it's so bad that oh my God, I can't have that. They're like, oh yeah, I know this is maybe a little bit, you know, not so great for me, but I'm going to have it, right? If you ask a man, like, do you think you're going to get fat? Most of the time they're like, no, no, I'm going to be fine, right? You ask a woman, are you going to get fat? They're like, I'm already fat. This is bad, right? Like it's already <laughs> oh, of uh, deprivation. And so I, you know, it's really about bringing yourself back to the state of abundance where it's like, I can have anything whenever I want. And therefore, you'll only ever want what you actually want, which is not excess, which is not a whole bunch of sugar, which is not any of these things. And so we make it harder on ourselves by feeling like we have to restrict, but it's the restricting that's leading to the binging and to the excess, whereas men don't restrict. And so oftentimes they don't, you know, struggle with the same amount of, you know, excess or, or sneaking food. You know, oftentimes it's women that are like, oh, we're like, you know, sneaking a chocolate bar, you know, when no one's looking or whatever, a man wouldn't, right? He would just be like, oh, I want a chocolate bar. Like, there's no guilt. There's no shame. I'm going to have it. And and I'm going to have the amount that feels good. That might be half the chocolate bar, right? And then, of course, they'll stop. And the woman will look at them and be like, how could you possibly not eat the whole thing, right? But it's like, <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't have this feeling of like, I can never have this again. Or like, I'm so bad for eating this. He knows that like, yeah, I'll just have half because if I want a chocolate bar again, I'm allowed to have one. Whereas a woman eating it is like, oh my God, okay, like after this, I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And that just makes you disconnect from eating the chocolate bar. And you're like, okay, well, I just need to finish it. This is the last, it's the last supper kind of energy, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. Wow. wow that, yeah. There is so much. Of, I mean, seriously, sister, we could do all, <laughs> all <of> that. <laughs> It's, it's funny, actually, I was going to mention that when you said about that, it reminds me of uh, not far from where I grew up, there's a, a big chocolate company. And they had lots of people eating the chocolate when they weren't allowed. And so what they did is they just said, eat as much chocolate as you like, help yourselves. And guess what? Nobody ate it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It goes to show, right? I, I often um, will share a, a similar example of like if you were to go to um, a grocery store, like, let's say it's like a really nice one. I know the one there that I like is like Waitrose, right? And if yeah. I go there and, and, and they're like, everything's free today. Like you can, like, we have this big discount. It's a hundred percent off, right? Of course, the first day you would stock up like crazy. You'd call your friends, you'd fill the cards, right? But if after every day you going there, them telling you like everything's free today, what would you do in the end? You would just take what you needed right? There wouldn't be this frantic need to fill up. And it goes to show it's the same thing with once we release the rules, there's this, we reduce the urgency to overeat because there's no, you know, we can remind ourselves, I have my whole life to eat. So I don't need to eat, you know, everything right now. <laughs> yeah. All of the cake today. Exactly. All the cooking is <laughs> one of the things that intrigued me as well as you know where, where do people with your with what you're doing with people where did what do they, how does that start what's the thing what does it look like in terms of the you know for your in terms of your program how does that yeah so um i mean so i work one-on-one -on -one with women uh because i different categories of um although i say that i can essentially work with any woman that's struggling with any sort of food issue um oftentimes it's uh a very individual, it's, okay, are you orthorexic, which is what I was talking about, where it's like, 
you've been obsessed with diets for perhaps several years of your life. You're always either on or off a diet. You're obsessed with either restricting and then that may or may not be leading to binging. Um, do you feel like you um, uh, not necessarily resonate with that, but you're like, you know what? I feel like food controls me and I don't have any self-control around food. It's, you know, I'm I'm always just, you know, indulging. Or on um, sort of the third category is... Um, People that feel like they don't have any sort of routine with food, they feel like they're not necessarily taking good care of themselves, they don't have any sort of rituals, they feel really disconnected from their hunger, from their satiety, everything kind of feels like a chore and they know that they're not really um, nourishing themselves from a place of self-love or self-respect. So it really gets down to, first of all, um, separating food from the movement of life. Eating is a break in life. We are meant to be sitting down. We are meant to be stopping whatever else we're doing and sit and eat, right? If we look at, you know, in France, they do a really good job of this. Guess what? In France, most people are slim, right? It's not because they're not eating, you know, croissants and butter because they are, but they're stopping to eat. They're um, they're really separating. Again, it, there's movement of life and then there's a break in life for food. And so that's number one. I get women to get super clear on um, actually separating those things. You know, when is it that you're multitasking? When are you snacking and also driving your kid to school? Are you, you know, do you have the, the, you know, the chips next to your computer when you're on a Zoom call or whatever it is? None of that. I'm not saying I'm not taking away any food, but I'm saying whenever you want to eat, you have to go to your kitchen table or whatever table, stop what you're doing and eat. And oftentimes women are like, oh my God, that's like, you know, but I don't want to, or like it's in, a, and it's like, then you don't want to eat. Because if you were truly hungry, then me saying, go sit down and, and stop, you know, writing that email, you'd be like, okay, of course, like I'm hungry, I'll stop. But if you're not really hungry, then me saying, stop doing the email and go sit down and eat, it's frustrating, right? And so it's really about getting clear on that. Um, we start opening up total and complete choice of all foods, which is often really scary, especially for women, because we're like, oh my goodness, no, I can't eat gluten. I can't eat dairy, blah, blah, I'm going to get fat, right? But it's like, nope, it's restricting that's leading to overeating. That's, you know, the problem. And so we really need to start considering, okay, well, what tastes good to me? And, um, you know, we have taste buds, not even just in our mouth, but all over our bodies. And when we really connect with the present moment, we can taste into the foods that uh, feel the best for us. And they're usually, again, the classic healthy food that we're, you know, sort of demanding ourselves to eat. Once we take out that demand, we can naturally start eating healthy again. Um, so total choice. Um, and then the, the third component is really getting uh, women comfortable with hunger and satiety, recognizing that hunger is not some tragic occurrence that we need to avoid at all costs. It is healthy to get hungry, right? We don't need to starve ourselves. We don't need to, you know, uh, push out hunger, but it is healthy to wait for hunger. And if that is a problem, then there's something in your life going on that you're using food as a buffer. And we need to figure out what that is so that you can attend to that and actually arrive at hunger and then honor it when it comes up by eating something that tastes good to you and then stopping at what I call a point of balance, not feeling full, heavy, bloated, but feeling comfortable, balanced and ready to stop the eating and therefore start the movement of your life again. And if the stop of eating is difficult, then that means the start of your life is difficult and you need to create a stepping stone to get back into the movement of your life. So that's kind of, I know I kind of skimmed through the whole thing, but like those are the right. overarching themes of, of what I'm doing with women. Uh, right. So much. And, and um, one of the things that really comes up because my background is healthcare, I'm a midwife, so working with women. And um, and also a research nurse, but 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 yeah. So I mean, it, it's just amazing when I I observe that women tend to have um, their intuitions suppressed by the way we're brought up in this society, not all societies, this society. And so because we're in that state of suppression, what you are actually doing is the exact opposite, which is going back to your body and tuning into that. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've seen amazing, I've seen miracles happen with women when they do that. And even in the childbirth scenario, you just help them to tune in because we're all up here. We're all up here. And actually what you just need to be friends. Exactly. And take you can almost 
or it, it can it can seem magical, right? And magical. I think because for a, a lot of us, I mean, like society really does not to like get too much into like feminine negative whatever but uh but like a society is is generally very masculine in the sense of like so so men uh work on a 24-hour hormonal cycle whereas women work on a 28-day hormonal cycle right and so what works for the men in the sense of you know like p- perhaps eating you know similar times waking up you know going to sleep and then you know reset it's different for women. There's going to be weeks when we want to eat more, eat less, be more energetic, less energetic. We don't reset after each day. Yet we live in a society where we kind of have to fit more of like the male hormonal cycle. And so we we try to train ourselves. To, okay, like this is the time that I have breakfast. This is the time that I have lunch. Oh, it's that, you know, today I have to work out because, you know, I work out X number of days. And it's, you know, we think that that's the way that we're going to be healthy. And the more right. that we, and, yes. exactly. And the more that we tune more into the feminine um, and perhaps, you know, and that means sometimes eating a, a little bit more, even if it's not necessarily on your plan. But it also means honoring when, you know, you're not very hungry. And instead of being like, oh, but, you know, it's it's 11 a.m. and I haven't had breakfast yet. I, I You know, I'll just make a smoothie. I have to get something in me. It's like, no, you, you can wait for hunger and, uh, you know, hunger always comes. So really trusting that, you know, some days I'll eat a little more, some days I'll eat a little less, some days I'll move a little more, some days I'll move a little less. And, um, and of course, we have to, um, you know, these messages might land better for the woman to kind of go, 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 push, push, push. Of course, if, if there's also the woman that has maybe let themselves go a, a little bit too much and they need more of a pep talk in the way of like, no, you know what? Like, get out there, go for a walk, you know, push a little bit harder. But I found for most of the women that I work with, it's less of me being like, you know, smash it harder. And it's more of me being like, maybe you need a nap, right? <laughs> um, so it's about finding, you know, uh, you know, what, what you need to thrive. Well, all the women in the world go, a nap. <laughs> it's one thing it's it's one number, though. <laughs> I know, in my dream. <laughs> Oh, my like, goodness, too much to talk about. And so where did you discover, I mean, with the, the title intuitive, that is the bit that I'm really interested in. So what is, what is it that you discovered in terms of in your intuition that made you go down the road of becoming an intuitive coach? So that's, that's so interesting that you asked because the title for me was actually such a turnoff. Um, in in North America, anyways, intuitive eating coaches, mindful eating coaches, they were super trendy, like about five, 10 years ago. And I so when I was struggling with food, a lot of people would say, like, why don't you work with an intuitive eating coach? Or, you know, have you tried mindful eating? And to me, that was I was like, I do not want to do that. Because I like my rules. I like my diets. I like being slender. And I don't want to give that up to like self love. Sorry, thanks, but no thanks. But like, maybe another day, right? Um, and so I was really turned off by it until I found a method that now that I use that is very structured because it's very clear that you have to honor hunger and taste. And so for me, um, although people don't like to, to talk about it, my fear was I'm going to get fat. Right. And so I had to actually own that, like, oh, I have this fear that I'm going to get fat and, and, and voice it and then be like, okay, well, is that possible if I, always simply wait for hunger before eating if I never eat if I'm not hungry and then if I only ever take myself to balance well yes that's you know I I wouldn't be fat if that were the case so could you know mindful eating or intuitive eating actually work for me in terms of taking away all the head chatter in my in my head but also really you know maintain my health and and slenderness and all these other aesthetic things that I also wanted as well right and so um it wasn't until that I found this structured method that I was like, okay, I get it, intuitive eating. Because I think a lot of women I know for me, they hear that and they're like, uh, that sounds very woo-woo. That sounds very vague, fluffy. Like I like, you know, let's say like I want to lose 10 pounds. I don't want to work with an intuitive eating coach who's just gonna tell me to love myself and eat what I want. Like that's not what I need, right? Like I need someone to be like whip me into shape. The 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 method that I use, like it whips you into shape, not from a place of, you know, um, self-hate or, you know, but it is, it's disciplined. It's self-respect, right? It's not, um, 
uh, you know, if, if we think of it like a child, right, it's not about just giving the child everything that they want in order to create a nice, you know, a happy, healthy human. No, it's about, you know, making sure that they have total choice of what they're eating and, you know, making sure that they have um, independence and freedom. But it's also the discipline to be like, no, it's time to go to bed now or like, you know, no, you've already played with your friends now. So it's time to do something else. Right. I'm not a mother, so I don't know the details, but uh, I think that's how I work. Right. Um, All of them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, so. So, yeah. So I eventually. And so, I mean, I never really came up with a good name for what I do. Um, but so many people are now kind of opening up to this like, oh, intuitive eating. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to go with with the mark flow and call myself an intuitive eating coach. Although I do feel like my method is a little bit different because there's more structure and discipline and, and boundaries that I think for people like myself who are a little bit more A-type, perfectionistic, um, we need that kind of, that that comfort of not necessarily rules, but feeling like we have like a blueprint and it's not just like, okay, I'm just going to tell you to like, go love yourself and, you know, see you next week. Uh <laughs> yeah. I have to say, I mean, everything you just mentioned, it just resounds with me so much. And um, so talk to us about food now, because like, you know, I'm Latin American, you're half Greek, we, we need to talk about food. So so what is like, what what does a day in your life look like? Particularly, let's say I was coming over, you were going to like do some large, we're going to do some girly things and all that. What are we going to eat? Oh my goodness. Well, you know what? Um, so let's, uh, so this morning, I'm um, so, and, and first of all, disclaimer of like, I'm not saying the, I'll share how I'm eating, but you know, we, oh, uh, whatever. let's not with Yeah. 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 Um, uh, uh, so, uh, the lately this morning, um, I've been doing, um, I'll do coconut, uh, flour mixed with an egg, a little bit of uh baking powder, cinnamon, um, perhaps a little bit of like monk fruit, um, or just a, a bit of coconut sugar, whipping that all up, putting it in a microwave, and it becomes like this like cake. And then I'll top it with blueberries, um, sheep milk yogurt, and, right. and some coconut flakes. And like, I know it sounds kind of weird, but it's literally like so divine. And so I'm very into dessert for breakfast, but I also need oh, <laughs> But, but it's like, we don't want to spike our blood sugars first thing in the morning, right? So this to me, it has basically hardly any sugar. I mean, again, sometimes I'll put a little bit of monk fruit, whatever. I can also miss it and just put some blueberries on there. Um, and, but it's satiating. You've got the eggs, so the protein, you've got good fats with the coconut. Um, and then I'll do a variation of that. Like sometimes I'll chop some avocado in it. Um, and so, uh, so yeah. And then for, for lunch, again, a lunch could be at any time because I simply wait for her, right? Um, I love um, bone broth. And so I'll usually have like a cup of bone broth. Um, and then I'll do some sort of um, protein, whether it's um, I do eat meat, clearly, I mentioned the, the bone broth. So I'll usually have some sort of, um, you know, small piece of either, you know, uh, like a, a pasture egg or a grass, fed, you know, beef or whatever it is with some vegetables. And I love sauerkraut. And then um, so, um, usually my two meals kind of fill me up that I don't actually end up really having dinner. Um, but if I do, it's, you know, sometimes just like a small, maybe it's, you know, a yogurt with some nuts. some nuts. Exactly. It's more of like a snack. And I'm not against snacking when it's actually like attending to hunger. I think I'm I'm I mean, I'm not against anything, but I'm not for snacking for the sake of um, avoiding hunger, right? It's like, oh, like, oh, I'm going to have a snack because you know, I might get hungry. It's like, no, 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 no. You can have a snack if you're hungry and it's not, you're not available to actually sit down and have a meal. Okay. To tie yourself over for the meal. But, um, so I'm not really a snacker. I don't really have like snacks in the house because I love my meals. It's such an intimate ritual experience that I have with myself. And, um, I move all the time. So I was in Mexico for two years. I don't really love, love Mexican food, to be honest, but I did. Yeah. We differ now. Now we differ. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I say, oh, I live in Mexico, they're like, oh my God, the food. And I'm like, see you. <laughs> but um, I did eat a lot of um, guacamole. I do love guacamole and I would do it with like coconut tortilla wraps. Um, and so, yeah. And I mean, you know, now I'm in Canada and there's a... Yeah, 
I don't really know, like poutine. I don't really know what's like Canadian food, like bacon. <laughs> um, but um, but we'll see. I like the adventurous, but also kind of just like always honoring um taste. And it's it's really before I used to be so focused on like making sure that I was eating healthy that I never even really enjoyed my food because it always felt like this this calculation in my head. And now that I'm like, I can eat whatever I want. I'd probably eat healthier because it's just it's coming from this place of like I want to enjoy something delicious which yeah. when things are delicious it's like what is it it's usually balanced it's usually fat protein car you know a little bit of carbs um I I tend to eat fairly lower carb I mean I think it's normal what the average person would consider low carb because I think the average person probably just eats too many carbs like well, you know yeah, yeah. Um, so so yeah I mean I think I eat a normal amount of carbs, which again, a normal person would be like, oh, that's very low carb. Like, no, well, probably just normal. Yeah. <laughs> my favorite bit about that was cake for breakfast. <laughs> seriously. Mine was well, Spark Girl. Like, oh man, yeah. Well, seriously. Well, well, so funnily enough, but, uh, from a male perspective, one of the things that was mentioned to me by a very well known uh, gap that, uh, that does uh, actually, he's better known for the work he does around. Um, uh, the it's uh, Paul McKenna who does yes. um, uh, lots of a hypnotherapy. hypnotherapy book. He actually brought out a book. Um, some of the things that he actually did uh, that were so fascinating for me was uh, feeds into what you were saying. Sit at a table, put your knife or fork down between mouthfuls, and because uh, and and he said and enjoy the food that you're eating and slow the whole process down. And he talks about the link between the mind and the stomach. Yeah. And sometimes you could even be, you think, might think you're hungry, but you're actually thirsty. And he says, go and have some water. So there's all those little tips that are really, really helpful. And it sounds like, you know, that you're advocating as well. That I, I before seeing that, you know, he did say, if you see somebody that's slightly overweight and they're eating, they're probably focusing on something else. They might be watching TV. They might be on their phone. And they're not even conscious that they're actually doing this yeah. uh, action. And I thought, oh, wow, what a revelation. That's a, a really positive way eh, to helping yourself. My mind now is going to, I'm, I'm like in my mind sitting at a big table. Now I've been to the Mediterranean a lot. And my people in South America are like just separated by an ocean with the same people. Yeah. And so, you know, even when I'm hanging out with, Greek friends or Spanish or yet we're all one people. We all feel the same because it's all, all about the table and the food. And it's the culture. You say people say Mediterranean diet. And if you're not observing the culture around eating, that you're not really following it because I you know, everything stops for lunch in France. Now yeah. the French have a diet that a lot of nutrition, you know, nutritionists will, exactly. will just fall off their chair. Well, oh my God, butter on everything, you know, cheese, why? this and that and they just eat they eat really what they call is kind of it's not the optimal diet for a bite but the french people are the slimmest in the whole of europe because they have a culture around eating that is it's so structured they are not snacking all day long the french are not they go out of the house in the morning they'll have a little coffee on the way out or they'll have a little coffee at home they tend not to have like a big, and then they might pick up maybe a poitra or something like that, but they'll sit down and have that little thing and they'll make it into a thing. Sometimes they'll get their newspaper and a lot of, I mean, a lot of French people smoke as well. So let's not go down that road, but that's not a good thing, but but whatever. But they've got this culture of of this eating and this ritual of the rituals through the day. That's what I want to say. It's the rituals through the day. And those rituals are, they are unbreakable. You can't get the people away from those rituals. And then they go, right, everything stops for lunch. They'll go home for two hours. The wife is at home or they'll, they'll, they'll cook or less. The kids will lay the table. And I think they'll get the fresh bread from the picked up on the way in. They'll break it. So there's a whole ritual around eating. Um, yeah. This and it doesn't. And, and the thing is, is they're not eating like eight times a day so that they can create these rituals, right? Because oftentimes, well, I'll be like, oh, I don't, I'll say, well, you have to stop what you're doing. And, you know, when you're eating and I don't have time, I'm so busy. I'm like, yeah, but you know what? It's like you're eating like eight times a day. And so that's why it feels chaotic. And that like, oh, I couldn't possibly stop what I'm doing. Couldn't you realistically stop what you're doing two to three times a day and eat? Probably. Like you're not the practice, right? Like you have time. Right? Yeah, sure. and like, 
But it's because we, you know, developed this culture of like always, again, it's the food and the movement, right? Sometimes it's not even physical movement. It's like what you were saying. It's watching TV. It's like you're still immersed in the doing of life versus really being in the present and eating is in the present moment. And just like you said, a Mediterranean diet, we can't just look at, oh, you know, a chicken breast or whatever it is. It's the Mediterranean diet. They're walking up hills. Like my grandmother was like walking up the flipping mountain when she was 90. Do you know what I mean? It's like, that's the Mediterranean diet. It's not just the food. It's the lifestyle. It's the sitting um, to eat, but it's also the walking in between. It's like all of these things. Um, I think the, the problem with society today is that we're sitting all day and we're eating all day and we are meant to be moving and we're meant to be feasting and fasting. We're never fasting, right? We're just always kind of in this grazing mode. And, um, you know, the good thing is, is once you tap back into more of the feasting and the fasting, you get to enjoy both more because when you're not, you get to enjoy life more. And when you're eating and fat and feasting, you get to enjoy the food more. So this whole process is about enjoying more of life, enjoying more of being in your body, because we want to enjoy our food, but we want to enjoy our body after our food. And it's okay to want that, right? So, um, so yeah, it's um, it's a great thing. I mean, really, I mean, I'm I'm now I'm laying the table in my mind. I've got all the olives and the things and all my stuff. Yeah, all the stuff. It's all there, and then I'll, I'm getting dessert ready. Don't worry. <laughs> there will always be dessert, and then there's leftover for breakfast. But don't worry, it's all sorted. Perfect. I yeah. am very much a dessert person. I like honestly every meal. Like I end with a little something something. So. Something oh, fantastic! <laughs> yeah, I was thinking so much. So it's it's interesting. So, how many women have you helped so far in the, in the work that you do? How long have you been doing? Yeah, so I've been doing this now for four years. Um, I haven't counted, but it's probably yeah. a, a couple hundred, definitely. Um, uh, because I used to do group coaching at the beginning, where I would work with almost ten women at a time through these sprints. Now I work with women one on one. I just find it faster for um, the woman in, in healing and getting what she wants. Um, so, so yeah, hundreds of women, and yeah, so I can confidently say that, like, if you are listening to this or watching this, and you feel like you know you have these weird struggles with food, they're not weird and they're not uncommon. Like so many of the women that I you know work with when, when we get started, they're like, oh my god, like you know, no one knows, but like, oh, I sneak food or like, oh, I feel like everyone else eats normally, but then there's me, you know, and it's like, no, you know, it, it's not you. It's a di- different conditioning from society. It's from beliefs that you picked up in childhood. And then, you know, we're in a world where then we're getting marketed that we need to be snacking on, you know, foods that don't necessarily make us feel good. So it's all of these things. Um, and it's really about, um, pulling out each one and 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 bringing it back to a more value-based belief so that you can enjoy life again and um so oh yeah amazing amazing well i'm i'm hungry already yeah, yeah. i had yeah. thought and yes you like to be hungry honor it honor it girl. absolutely you know what one of the <laughs> things i love is actually intermittent fasting but i don't so i don't i'm 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 i would be a very bad type of you because i'm not very strong <laughs> I struggled with structure, but I do listen to my body. So I do listen to my body. That's the only that's, structure you need. That's, that's it. And, and when this girl tells me, you know, it's time to eat, I'll find food and and my body will tell me what I need. Um, and I, I really enjoy the part of the fasting thing. And then I look forward to that meal in the evening. Yeah. And it's just that that lovely thing. And then you, we make a thing of it and it's just a great. So, um, yeah, it's that feeling of hunger is an important thing that people almost feel like they shouldn't feel hungry. Shouldn't yeah. It it's is sharp when it's the mind as well. You feel sharp when you're fast. And I think that for a lot of women, they mistake hunger for anxiety. It's like hunger is calm. It's 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 not this frantic thing, right? And if you're metabolically flexible, if you're eating, you know, your your healthy fats and proteins and all these things, then you can go long periods of time without eating and then feel like this comfortable, you know, hunger. And it's not this stressful, like, oh my God, you know, hanger that people talk about. That's anxiety. That's, you know, um, your blood sugar dropping. That's other things going on. We can't blame every problem on hunger, right? And so as you say, now that you've, 
you know, you, that you do the fasting thing, you're able to kind of, you know, tap into that lovely flow state that you get into when you're in um, essentially a state of ketosis when you're in kind of burn mode versus just running on sugar. Um, and you're in that zone. And then when you get to break it, it's like, oh, it's this beautiful experience. It's yeah. Uh, uh, Think the other thing I would like to add as well about the, some of the ethos that we come from is that, you know, not no blame here. You know, we are where we are. Let's move through to solution because and nobody should be feeling because we always talk about cooking without an eating cake without guilt. No guilt. Nobody needs to feel guilty. You know, we've all been through a pandemic. It's all been really tough times. Everybody's gained a few pounds during that period. Nobody's fault. We've been locked down. But you know, we've, we've you know, obviously between us and what what you're saying, the uh, yeah, the of the yeah. work that we're doing, absolutely, absolutely. I just yeah. and we really, I mean, as a brand for us, we really stand for family being together and together and cooking together and being in the kitchen, and um, and it's just such a beautiful thing. Basically, just because that, that's what in my family, anyone that stops through the door, we're like in the kitchen, we're yeah. going to cook. <laughs> on and it becomes an event you know and such a beautiful thing to do as a family together is to eat and to have friends over you know when you have friends over and just to make that joyous kind of a mode so i think to take that away from people and say you must do this and you that is bad food and this is that is like that is a toxic environment that only harbors mental health problems <laughs> in my experience as a yeah. healthcare professional you create that environment that's a toxic environment where you are nurturing mental health problems of all descriptions that manifest in all types of physical problems as well. So it's a toxic environment. So we want to remove that and just let people relax. And the more they relax around eating, which is basically what you're saying, which is an amazing, amazing um, transformation that you help your your clients to make, I think we can see results. And that's when that anxiety and that love and that nurturing, you step back into that, that's where the miracle Ah, oh, I so agree. Let it be easy. Let it be enjoyable. And, you know, I think we, we often think that like in order for change to happen, it's like, oh, we need to struggle. We need to push harder. And it's like, no, we can still, you know, enjoy our food. We can enjoy our life. And actually, the more that we surrender, the more that um, the more the benefits that we get. And, and just like what you were saying, where it's like we have to start with where we are, like shame, guilt, self-hate. That doesn't, we think that, oh, uh, you know, that'll push me forward. It doesn't. It, it does the opposite. But the more that we're kind of like, okay, you know, I, I often tell my women, I, I don't, I don't need you to love yourself right now, but I need you to respect yourself because if you respect yourself, you'll, you'll make good choices, right? It might feel like a stretch to be like, oh, I'm going to practice self-love, but there has to be an element of self-respect. Um, and it's like, oh, you know what? I'm not necessarily maybe in the body of my dreams right now, but that's um i need to kind of put that on the shelf for now i need to parking lot that and ultimately follow the feeling in my body right now you know hunger taste all of these things and you know from there i'll i'll move forward and i know that i'm on my path and so i really you know appreciate the perspective that you're coming from where it's not a dogmatic approach you know i know it's called sugar-free tv but i know that you guys are the sugar police right it's just a matter of that uh, the other thing that I was going to about the party, it's completely the opposite. <laughs> the other thing I would I would say that the the thing that it, it's the, what you're doing is also saying very much to me is that there is also an intangible benefit that it, it because what we find is that and as Navida alluded to that about having the family involved because of course what you're doing there as well with your clients is that by having structures and things and th those will pass on to the children because. We've had people on the, a really anti, the, on the no sugar message. And what they've actually said is that parents that are addicted to sugar also make their children addicted. But of course, coming in from, it, from your side, yeah, those things that you're doing and then having the family involved and having uh, food when you're hungry and together, those habits will pass through. So that is a brilliant thing, brilliant take what yeah. That is, you know, uh, we, we, we want to help people reduce the amount of sugar. But we're, even we, although it's sugar-free TV, even we still go out. I mean, I'm not going to go to a birthday party and somebody goes, have a slice of cake. Oh, oh no. It's got <laughs> so I'm like, yeah. relax. Yeah, actually, this like, because I'm not eating like that every day, it's not yeah. going to harm me. I can exactly. have a piece of cake sometimes at somebody's birthday party and not act like 
you know, a rude person <laughs> and, and have to go, oh, no, I can only fit. But at the same time, you know, um, I know my body's getting good nutrition the rest of the time. And when it's getting that good nutrition, it doesn't matter if I have a piece of cake once in a while. It's okay. It, there's no, there's no shame. There's nothing. So, so I think, yeah, what we, we're trying to expose is, I think the worst thing that we see is the pernicious industries that have been created to addict people to the foods that then they may uh, then there's a diet industry to make people feel bad about the things that they've been addicted to so you create the addiction and then you create this the industry to fix the addiction then you create the drugs to fix the illnesses then how exactly and then go to hell there you go so so it's an entire loop closed loop of toxicity (laughs) ecosystem of toxicity and we're like that is nothing to do with yeah. How to be healthy and happy as a family and as an individual. So, yeah. Oh, my goodness. It's been you, yeah. such a pleasure speaking with you. So, what I wanted to, if, if there are any closing words that you want, anything, any inspirational um, things that you want, if somebody's watching this now and they're like, oh, my gosh, that is, I mean, every woman on the planet is going, that is me. <laughs> that is me. So, what can they do? We're, obviously, we're going to post some of links to your material and you've mentioned your book. Is there anything that you want to leave us? nuggets of gold well i will say um first of all in terms of like inspiration you know if you have a stomach then all good you have the tools that you need to succeed so so rest assured um and i would say as a first step really start to separate your your eating from the rest of you know the activities in your life and see how that works for you um regardless of the severity of your you know quote unquote food issues just simply getting more present with each and every time that you eat um, can be life changing in and of itself. Um, and then I do have some different free resources um, on my site, Kiki Athanis. So uh, feel free to, to to grab those. I have an intuitive eating guide. Um, I have a vision board template of you know becoming your healthiest self. All these different things. So um, uh, yeah, but overall, kind of like just know that you're not alone, and also that the solution is uh, a lot faster and easier than you think. I see women who are struggling so badly with with restricting and binging and within a week or two, they're eating back to balance, eating within their rhythm, feeling it's almost anticlimactic they're healing because they've almost forgotten that they used to be in such a way. And so also know that um, the gut and the body is so resilient and, and that can be possible for you. And so it's just you know, they say change isn't a process. It's a it's a choice. It's a decision. And so, you know, and I'm sure by watching sugar free TV and, and being part of this, you've already made that decision that it's like, OK, I, like I matter and I'm going to start acting like that. But uh, I've been right. such a pleasure having you. And we'd love we'd love to meet you and we'd love to have you back. So and any time you're in the UK, like at love. We will eat together and chat together. <laughs> I might be there later this summer and I might be uh, there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely reach out. Definitely reach out. It's an absolute pleasure having you here, Kiki. And we'll be posting your links to your resources as well. It's such a pleasure having you. And we really look forward to having you back. Yeah, Sugar Free TV. What an inspiration. Lots of love. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.